I thought I should start my presentation by referring to the global trends in the 20th century. That in the last century, there has been a shift uh, in the ethical and political thinking in the field of public policy. And we can focus on two of uh, these changes here. One, <coughs> that one shift is that it challenges the idea that professionals are the sole experts of knowledge, expertise. Experts are not the sole orders of expertise. That has been a movement in the last century. The other one is a movement that demands for great, greater stakeholder involvement in public policy. So these two movements have been going on concurrently in the last century. They really bring together uh, this overall thinking. And that is to move away from the thinking that knowledge and decision making are things best left to authorities, but towards more inclusive approaches. So just like you know, professionals are not the sole holders of expertise, the thinking is that knowledge and decision making should not be left to authorities alone, but that it should be much more inclusive. When you come down to health, these movements uh, were reflected, for example, in the Declaration of Amata in 1978, where the statement goes that people have the right and duty to participate individually and collectively in planning and implementation of their health care, individually and collectively. So, that brings us to public engagement with the research. Given that movement in the last century, which continues in the current century, we do research, a lot of research, and the world invests a lot of resources onto research. Research must be for a purpose. It's not research for the sake of doing research. And the ultimate purpose of research really should be to improve the well-being of humanity. Suddenly, research in health, that's what it is about. That ultimate purpose will be best attained if the public also contributes. And that can help us to realize that greater purpose in a more uh, comprehensive manner and in uh, bringing greater returns to investment. So public engagement provides an opportunity to individuals and communities, as stated in the Alma Aja, to contribute information, but also to internalize the ideas that are coming from research. For example, they can contribute to priority stating what are the priorities that we should be researching about? They can contribute to the process of research as well as content, and most importantly, how we use the outputs of research. So the engagement fosters a sharing of experiences and generates viewpoints from the public perspective. We give opportunity for all these different groups to be heard and contribute in shaping the research that is done, as I said, in priority setting or the process itself. And so shaping the research that is done and the kind of health services that should be delivered. And I say should because the population or the public has demands how the health services should look like, but that is not is always delivered. So we are gathered here today 
as those who are expected to engage the public because we are doing research. We shouldn't just stop at producing the research and say that's the end of it, we have published it. We are those expected to engage the public or even represent the public sometimes or as gatekeepers. Because many times we are actually gatekeepers. But also because we ourselves are part of the public and we do have a stake in the research that is done. That is in the production, promotion, and the application of research funding. The public is not out there. We are part of the public. And so we should have also interest in the outcome or the outputs of research and see how this can be put to better use. So, why conduct research? We've just said that research should be conducted for a purpose. Uh, Evidence-informed practices are talked very much about these days, and they do require that we use the most up-to-date findings, looking at what has been over time up to the present, so that we can inform decision-making or financing of services, organizing and delivering health services, as well as for those who deliver healthcare services. We need to use information in order to inform best practices. Uh, about seven years ago, a study was done looking at the statements and policies, recommendations, guidelines that are coming out of WHO. One of or two of the colleagues that I and a few of us work with were involved in the study from WHO, trying to look at the policies and guidelines that come out of WHO. How are they informed by evidence from the many studies carried out around the world? And the results actually were most shocking. And that is not too far back, around seven years ago. Because it did show that whereas WHO was doing a great work, many times the policies and guidelines that come out of there are not actually based on the most sound and up-to-date evidence available around the world. As you know, WHO from time to time calls upon individuals, and probably some of you have been, and they send you a letter to come and be an expert for the period of your stay in Geneva discussing a particular issue. And actually the discussions many times are based on the expert opinion, you as an expert, without going into great depth regarding what is the accumulated evidence over time? They do not use, or they were not using as much systematic reviews, for example. So that report did shake up WHO, and indeed a lot of changes subsequently did occur so that WHO could conform to using the best evidence available in producing guidelines, in producing policies, and so forth. So, sadly, use of research findings for health-related decision-making is lowest in low- and middle-income countries. And yet we know that the low- and middle-income countries have got the highest burden of illness or health challenges, and they have the most limited resources. And therefore, low and middle con uh, income countries, given that they've got a huge burden of illness and yet they've got the least resources, surely they should, they should use the best evidence available so that then the resources that we commit to healthcare or health systems are producing the best results and best on that good information. 
So what is the problem? Why aren't we using the research that is available? Part of the problem lies in the different cultures surrounding those who are doing research and those who are intended to use research. The two worlds seem to operate with very different cultures. And yet, at the end of the day, they are all trying to serve the same population, the public. So the researchers with their cultures are trying to produce information that will help the public. And the policy makers are trying to put in place policies and systems to help the public. But the different cultures surrounding this two groups of people are different, and yet we need to bring them to converge. So decision makers accuse researchers of being irrelevant and poorly committed to the products that they produce, that we are irrelevant. We do the research which we think is important, not that the policy makers and doers and practitioners think are important or the public thinks is important. And then the researchers accuse decision makers of political expediency that results in irrational uh, outcomes. And that is a quotation by one of those brilliant researchers, Jonathan Lomas. So this problem can be summarized uh, on this slide, which some of you may have seen before somewhere, that the problem is there is a gap between knowing, that is, after you've produced your results, you know what you know. There's a gap between knowing and doing, the policy makers doing or the practitioners doing. And this gap can be illustrated here with the policy makers on one side hanging away on this cliff while the researchers are on the opposite side and there's a gap between these two. And the question is, how do we bridge the gap between these two different cultures? So the researchers are very busy producing their evidence, or their data and information, and they wonder at the end of it, why can't the policy makers hear us? Why can't they see what we are doing? The policy makers are sitting out here. And they wonder, these policy makers, have the researchers really have anything to say that is sensible? They are doing things for enriching their CVs and beyond. Question is, how will talking to you help us? The researchers, how will talking to you fellows help us? And also, of course, the policy makers must be asking themselves, how will talking to you help us? So we need to bridge that gap, that divide, so that there is, um, we work together. So <clears throat> another way of presenting this is in this cartoon, which has been titled The Trust Problem. It's not my cartoon. It's borrowed from somewhere else. And you've got this fellow who is up in the balloon and he's saying, where am I? And the other one is saying, you are 30 meters above the ground. This guy says, oh yeah, you are 30 meters above the ground. And this fellow who is in the balloon says, well, you must be a researcher, I think. And this fellow replies, yes, I'm a researcher, but how did you know? The guy up here says, because what you told me is absolutely correct, but completely useless. <laughs> I mean, if I'm 30 meters above the ground, where am I? I'm out there in the universe. So this fellow says, well, if you think, let's go back to the previous one. Remember I said, because what you told me is absolutely correct, but completely useless. And so this one responds, 
to say, well, then you guy here, you must be a policy maker. And the other one says, yes, I am. But how did you know? And this one says, because you don't know where you are, this one is, remember this one is telling this one, because you don't know where you are, you don't know where you are going, and you are blaming me. So, with that kind of thinking between the policy makers and the doers on the other side, we have been thinking over time, how do we better make use of the research that is being done? And here, I want in the next few slides to summarize briefly uh, examples of what we are doing. Maybe actually I should have put as one of the first example is one of our current PhD uh, colleagues is doing a study, his focus area is questions himself. Medical school started in the 20s. We've had many dissertations. As a College of Health Sciences, we have continued to do a lot of research from masters and from PhDs. What has happened to all these? How have they influenced re, uh, policy and practice? And believe me or not, he has found an issue with that question and he has taken it up for a PhD. How has the research of masters and PhDs influenced policy and practice over the last, and he's trying to look at the last 10 years? To show you the seriousness of the matter, somebody could actually walk around with a PhD in a few years from now because he concerned himself with this issue as it relates to the College of Health Sciences. Secondly, one of our own, Kaye, he, uh, a few years ago, 2011, but it started in 2010, I think, uh, he got a small grant from Wellcome Trust to look at this issue and see what we can do about it. After, no, I think it started in 09. Uh, after about two years of work, one of his products was this, that he came up with a training manual entitled Engaging the Public with Global Health Research Using Science Communication Approach. This is available. There are copies. If, if you want uh, to have access to that, it is available. It's not for putting in the shelf. Again, it is for the public to use. So a training manual. Of course, this was the first version of it. Uh, it may require updating uh, as time goes along, but that was a very important step. Secondly, we started a sure project, which is uh, into its uh, fourth year now and should be ending next year. This is funded by the European Union. SURE stands for supporting use of research evidence, and it is a research project. Trying to see how can we bridge that gap that we saw? How can research evidence be, uh, how can we facilitate use of research evidence to inform policy and practice? So it has had a number of achievements. Uh, some of them are listed here that it has developed resources or tools that to facilitate knowledge translation practices. Secondly, uh, it's provided, or it is providing a rapid response service to policy makers. Let me explain this a little bit. What is the rapid response service? Policy makers, on a day-to-day, -day, they struggle with issues for which they require immediate answers. 
Many times they do not have the luxury of waiting for many months or many weeks before they get an answer. Parliament is on fire. They are debating whatever they are debating. And they are challenging the Minister of Health with information. The minister runs back to his ministry and says, we need an answer to this issue. We need information. What is the available information regarding this particular issue? So that when I go back to talk in 24 hours or 48 hours or next week, I speak sense. I speak from an informed position instead of guesswork. This is how policymakers in their world they live. Many times they have to address issues urgently. An epidemic crops up and they have to talk sense. What is the evidence from the region, from the international, from the country? And so when they are faced with those specific issues and problems and they're looking for answers, they want a rapid response system, a system which can to which they can pose a particular question or issue and they get the answers to that issue. And so, as part of the SURE project, we started a rapid response service in this college. And I would tell you that this kind of thing has not been done in any low or middle income country. This is the one place that it has started. And when it started, it has generated a lot of interest around Africa. They have started the response, rapid response service in Burkina Faso. They've started one in Cameroon, for example. And above all, Canada is impressed with what is being done here. And resulting from this, they are discussing intensively at McMaster University to start a rapid response system. So the low-income country uh, is having to teach something to the high-income country. The other example I may give is the development of evidence briefs. In bracket, I put policy. Many times we hear about policy briefs. Even the university, McKerry, talks about policy briefs. We hesitate in our group to call them policy briefs because when you look at the world of policy briefs, it's a mix of many things. It's a mix of many things. What are our briefs like? Our briefs are produced to inform the practitioner, to inform the policy maker using evidence. Look at the available evidence, summarize that, and produce the brief. So it is an evidence brief, evidence-based brief. And so the reason we hesitate to call them policy briefs, because we know the world of policy briefs is a mixed bag of many things which mean different things. But it's the commonly used term, and so I put it here. So we are developing uh, evidence briefs and holding policy dialogues with policy makers. And the, the way these evidence briefs are being done is not the traditional way. Again, it is some innovation that is taking place. Thirdly, or fourth, remember I started with a PhD a fellow who is looking at how the masters and PhDs are influencing policy and practice. So, fourthly, we have recently started what we are calling, trying to be very grandiose, the Africa Center for Systematic Reviews. Why is it important to start a center for systematic reviews. Because as you look at the evidence that is out there, 
the world today, ever since the, st uh, the start of the Cochrane collaboration, has been looking at, yes, in order to make a firm statement about an issue, you need to look at the evidence that is out there and then conduct a systematic review and make a statement based on all those studies that do exist. So if we are really interested in bridging the gap between the policy makers and the researchers, we need to have systematic reviews in place. And so the Africa Center has started and has got a small grant from the International Development Research Center and we think it's going to make a difference. Whereas it has been in existence for five months or so, already there is movement forward, including an international workshop held here and with six countries participating in that workshop. So, lastly, an example, and these are just examples, uh, so that you don't take me to task to say, but there is the other effort also ongoing. So the Innovations and Knowledge Translation Office, which he has talked about, was established also. Uh, it's been in place now for about one and a half, or close to two years. Uh, and this office, as far as we know, and we've talked to other people around <laughs> the globe, this is probably the first of its kind, best in an academic institution. To have a, a knowledge, innovations and knowledge translation office in an academic institution. Again, an innovation that we feel proud of. You were introduced to that office, but suffice for me to say that this office is intended to provide a bridge between the producers and users of research. Keep looking back at that cartoon, that divide between the two groups. How do we bridge that divide? So we think that this office could provide that bridge by organizing knowledge, knowledge exchange uh, platforms, for researchers and research users to interact and promote the use of research evidence in healthcare and health promote, uh, prom formulation. And also to strengthen knowledge and skills and improve attitudes of both policy makers and researchers to do better in using the research results, which is basically what this is about today. Also, that office is supposed to support intellectual property uh, protection processes because researchers do their research, they come up with a brilliant innovation or discovery, and they don't even realize <coughs> that this could lead to a patent. Or they do everything, the innovation is okay, the discovery is fine, but they do all the wrong processes and therefore they cannot patent the product that they have. How can they we want to improve their knowledge on what you have to watch out for if your product is going to be patentable? You shouldn't shoot yourself in the foot. And finally, provide ongoing technical support to researchers in developing evidence briefs not policy briefs, although sometimes we falter uh, because policy briefs is so common and it's a policy brief. No, for us we want to develop evidence briefs and engage research stakeholders like policy makers and the public. With those few comments, reminds us Albert Einstein, who lived during this time, he probably lived ahead of his time and says, don't let the measurable. And so he would like to add the publishable drive out the relevant. Which relevant? The non-scientific evidence from the field. 
the non-scientific evidence from the public. The public, the evidence from there needs to be added to what is measurable, what is not measurable, in order to give us the best results. So in summary, researchers and research users need each other and we need to work together. I thank you for your attention.